Good afternoon and good morning. This is Kim Ostrowski from Content Enablers, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's webinar, U.S. Trade Compliance Training for China Operations, presented by the Char School of Policy and Government at George Mason University and Content Enablers in collaboration with Squire Patton Boggs and the U.S. China Business Council. Today's webinar will be a series of presentations from representatives from the U.S. CDC, Squire Patton Boggs, the Char School, and Content Enablers, and will be approximately one hour and 15 minutes long. Our panelists will be happy to take your questions today, so please feel free to submit them through the Q&A chat box on the webinar platform. Our host today is Brad Kavanaugh, the founder and president of Content Enablers. Content Enablers is a pioneer in the area of global trade compliance training, providing training based on job function and compliance responsibility. We support the world's leading aerospace, defense, and technology companies with online solutions that put compliance training in the context of our clients' location, products, and services. Through Brad's vision and leadership over the past 20 years, Content Enablers has become the world's leader in online trade compliance training. Please welcome Brad Kavanaugh. Brad, please begin. Good morning and welcome everyone. Um, I'm very pleased to be here today and have all of you join us for the official launch of our online compliance training collaboration, specifically for doing business in China between content enablers of the Shar School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. And help me um, today present this exciting new model. I'm very pleased to be joined by Mark Rosell, the Dean of the Shar School, and also to provide some additional perspective and market insight um, I have the honor of introducing Craig Allen, the president of the U.S. China Business Council, and George Gravis, the partner and co-chair of International Trade Practice for Global Trade Compliance and National Security at Square Peg Fox. Uh, we're very excited about this uh, new training collaboration because I believe it really responds to some of the specific challenges that we're, we currently face as a trade compliance community, but it also reflects the opportunities that are presented by trade organizations and, and partners working together because, you know, some of you may have heard um, there's an election coming up in just a matter of days and you know, trade policy, regulation, enforcement, all that is going to be affected and impacted by the election and U.S. China policy is certainly an important component of that discussion. And also keep in mind that all of this uh, is framed by the reality of COVID-19 and how that affects and impacts compliance training, things like travel restrictions, remote workforces, social distancing, and increasingly simply the fact that training budgets are at risk. But with all of those uncertainties and all of the issues that are gonna be evolving in the coming days, weeks, and months, the fact is you need to keep yourself and your company compliant and properly trained, and that simply hasn't changed. So this new collaboration combines content enablers, um, functional specific trade compliance training and our unique platform with Square Patent Boggs' uh, regulatory, legal market knowledge, and the Shire School's excuse me, regional expertise in the Chinese market. So with that, I'd like to share a very short overview of the new uh, training collaboration itself. And after that, we'll introduce our panelists, Matt. As an international trade compliance professional conducting business in or with China, you understand that recent U.S. policy reconsiderations have significantly impacted how global companies operate in China, as well as how Chinese corporations manage their operations in relation to their compliance with U.S. regulations. Navigating the complex mosaic of U.S. export control regulations can be very challenging, but it is critical to avoiding fines, penalties, reputational damage, and simply to protect your business. And successful trade compliance programs must include comprehensive, functionally relevant, and continuous training. And that is why Content Enablers, the global leader in online compliance training, is delighted to announce a new collaboration with the Share School of Policy and Government at George Mason University, with subject matter expertise from our good friends at Square Patton Boggs to help companies as well as individual trade practitioners meet these challenges with unique training solutions that reflect global and U.S. regulatory requirements with particular relevance to businesses operating in China, industry best practices, and you or your employees' job functions and compliance responsibilities. 
Through the SHAR training storefront, china.tradecompliance.courses, you can access a wide array of trade compliance training, including the CE Trade Compliance for Executive Leadership course that's available both in English and Mandarin that communicates how executive leaders need to view export, import, corruption, and sanctions and embargo training as an integrated program to mitigate corporate risk. It discusses key trade concepts relevant to typical business transactions that help senior leaders understand the critical role that they play in promoting and ensuring effective trade compliance programs and culture, essential ingredients to the long-term success of the company. Our Global Trade Compliance Overview for General Employees, also available in English and Mandarin, discusses key trade concepts with a focus on international export controls. The training outlines how export controls operate, how they affect business, and provides information that helps employees recognize situations that involve export activities and regulations. The Trade Compliance Overview modules are designed to help learners understand how to identify potential compliance risks in their specific day-to-day -day activities. These functional modules, available in English and Mandarin, include modules for after sales, human resources, legal, logistics, procurement, research and development, and sales and marketing. Our Foundation of U.S. Export Compliance is a practitioner course designed to introduce users to the six primary areas of trade compliance that are addressed in a typical company under the primary U.S. trade control regulations. And the U.S. Export Control Advanced EAR course is designed for practitioners as well and covers legal foundations of the EAR, including regulatory definitions and concepts, export authorizations and support documents for license applications, use of license exceptions, special reporting requirements, commodity classification requests, requirements for encryption items and chemical subject to CWC, violations, voluntary self-disclosure, and related sanctions. It then brings these regulations to life with a series of cradle-to-grave case studies that illustrate and apply the concepts in a variety of business settings. Each of the course offerings includes a certificate of completion from the Shar School and continuous learning throughout the subscription. Subscribe to any of the U.S. Trade Compliance Training for China Operations Library and take advantage of all that comes with being a member of our community. Well, I hope that gave you a good idea of what the actual training looks like, but to help add some perspective of uh, why this compliance training is so important, Craig Allen is here to share some of his thoughts on U.S.-China relations and the critical issues facing businesses post-U.S. election. So um, allow me a minute to give you a, a little overview of Greg's bio for those of you that don't uh, know him. It's, it's exceptionally impressive and we're glad to have him here today. So in 2018, Craig began his tenure as the sixth president of the U.S. China Business Council, a private nonpartisan nonprofit organization representing over 200 American companies doing business with China. Craig's last government position was U.S. Ambassador to Brunei Dar es Salaam, and before that, he served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for China in the Department of Commerce's ITA and Deputy Assistant Secretary for Asia. Craig served previously as Senior Commercial Officer at the U.S. Embassy in South Africa and a Senior Commercial Officer at the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. When in Beijing, he was promoted to Minister Counselor rank in the Senior Foreign Service, and while on the uh, Foreign Service assignment to the National Center for APEC in Seattle, Craig worked for APEC summits in Brunei, China, and Mexico. Earlier posts were as Deputy Senior Commercial Officer and Commercial Attaché at the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo, as commercial attaché at the embassy in Beijing and as director of the American Trade Center in Taipei. Craig served as a, excuse me, uh, Craig received an MS in foreign service from Georgetown and a BA in political science and Asian studies from the University of Michigan. So go blue, Craig. And with that, uh, <laughs> Craig Allen. Well, thank you, well, thank you so, so very much, Brad. Uh, I hope that everyone can hear me. Please excuse me for using a phone. I had some technical difficulties uh, this morning. Let me start out by thanking content enablers, uh, the Shar School of Policy and Governments at GMU, and Squire Patent Boggs uh, for uh, this opportunity. Um, I think that corporate executives uh, could certainly be excused 
uh, if they were confused about the incredible regulatory changes associated with uh, U.S.-China trade policy over the last few years. All companies that have a nexus uh, with China, but especially those that are involved in R&D or technology, must be up to date and conversant with a very large body of uh, constantly changing regulation and administrative requirements. And this is hard. Um, USCBC is watching some 400 pieces of legislation, uh, much of which uh, will complicate American companies uh, that uh, do business in China. Um, the interest in the Congress is driving the regulatory agencies in the executive branch to constantly do more uh, to advance American in interests. Uh, and that is often by more tightly regulating uh, technology. And this uh, is leading to further complications in the regulatory environment uh, uh, for companies uh, that export uh, to China. There has been a steady uh, but pretty unpredictable flow of, I would call it a flood of new regulations, administrative judgments and prosecutions that have impacted companies in a very direct manner. And don't expect this uh, to stop soon. Um, contemplating uh, the problem of uh, the regulatory burden uh, of uh, exporting and uh, doing business in China is a little bit looking like looking at the mighty Mississippi River. Uh, you have to wonder, where did all that water come from? And uh, what are the currents in that river like? And if you're a boatman trying to take a product from one side to the other, you've got to wonder, how can I maneuver my boat uh, through those uh, currents safely? So I'd like to uh, take a stab at the first uh, two questions. Where did all that water come from? Um, and uh, what are the currents like? And I'll leave it uh, to the experts in compliance to uh, tell you how to maneuver your boat safely uh, through those currents to get your goods uh, to the other side. So firstly, let's talk about uh, why the, why, where did all the water come from? Why this enormous uh, regulatory uh, burden? Well, um, China has about 19% of the global population and 40 years ago, uh, China's population was, uh, or GDP, per capita GDP, was about equal to Central Africa. Uh, but uh, they've gone from about $190 of, uh, per capita GDP in 1979 uh, to about $10,000 uh, per capita GDP uh, 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 this year. Um, so, in, uh, 40 years ago, when we established dip diplomatic relations, uh, the Chinese economy was yeah, approximately a tenth of uh, America's. Today, it is uh, roughly equal. Um, moreover, the demographic trends um, clearly suggest that China will be the main engine of growth uh, in the global economy for uh, the next 10 years. Um, and it is uh, extremely likely uh, that China will, um, China, the Chinese GDP will exceed that of the United States uh, within 10 years and then 50 years uh, uh, might very well be double uh, the size of the United States. And that just makes sense as they have four to five uh, times more population uh, than uh, the United States. So closely correlated uh, with its rapid economic growth and increasing power, there's been increasing U.S.-China conflict across all the different dimensions of uh, international affairs and foreign policy. Uh, and that, of course, would uh, include visas, human rights, geopolitics, ideolo uh, ideology, trade, and technology. It's, it's kind of uh, uh, all-encompassing. Um, uh, what is indisputable uh, is that uh, the U.S.-China relationship is the most important bilateral relationship uh, in the world, and equally indisputable that uh, same relationship is under uh, great uh, stress. So if you wanted to answer the question, where did all that water come from, uh, I think that uh, one could 
would do well to look at uh, theodicies uh, uh, from 500 uh, uh, BC Athens uh, and, and note that when a rising power challenges a status quo power, uh, there uh, is going to be uh, a, a big reaction. Political scientists uh, call this uh, a security dilemma. Uh, when one uh, country takes uh, steps that it feels as positive uh, or, or defensive, uh, but uh, the other country looks at it and says, hmm, that's offensive, not defensive, and they take counter steps and on and on, uh, such that you have a, uh, uh, a uh, spiral downwards of competing measures. Uh, and, and thus, that is where all the water is coming from. And uh, export controls on the U.S. side are, are increasing. Export controls on the Chinese side are also increasing at a commensurate manner. And that is the perfect definition of, or the perfect example of a political science uh, uh, security dilemma. I would say the conflict is uh, uh, absolutely avoidable uh, with good diplomacy. Uh, and there's nothing about the Theodicy's trap that suggests uh, conflict is inevitable. But the regulations that we're talking about today are in large part a response uh, to uh, perceptions of a rising threat in, uh, in China uh, among uh, Congress, among the American people, uh, and a feeling that something must be done and increasing uh, the uh, export control regulations and investment regulations and uh, other uh, uh, controls is a natural result. So let me try to uh, describe, uh, if you will, uh, the eddies and the currents of the river uh, that you are facing um, because it is uh, incredibly complex and there are many dangers there. And I'd like to kind of divide it uh, or, or analyze it uh, in terms of uh, four uh, uh, major categories of controls that companies need to be concerned about. Um, there are export controls, uh, sanctions, other measures and prosecutions, um, and then uh, pending uh, legislation uh, as well. So. Uh, on export controls, um, I would note uh, that there have been many changes uh, over uh, the last three years. Uh, for example, the rationale for export controls has expanded uh, to human rights. There's been a huge expansion of uh, the entities list. Uh, before, that was limited to American national security concerns, uh, but not now. Uh, it is uh, much more uh, expansive uh, than that. The foreign direct uh, product rule expands the extraterritorial control uh, of uh, U.S. exports controls. And, and thus, you know, for those who are shipping uh, to Europeans or Japanese or, or, or Americans, uh, I think, or, or uh, other countries, third countries, uh, need to uh, uh, be concerned about that. The military end user and the military end use control is a major um, uh, shift. Uh, making it uh, more, uh, forcing you uh, to increase your compliance uh, in uh, China. Uh, the civilian uh, export uh, license acceptance also is a major uh, change. The de minimis rule is a change. Um, watch uh, the emerging and foundational technologies list. Uh, just last week, new regulations came out uh, on emerging uh, uh, technologies. I think uh, the role of Hong Kong has changed uh, uh, with regard to export controls. Uh, many companies had used Hong Kong as sort of as a safe harbor in the past, and uh, that has uh, those regulations have changed. And other agencies outside of the Department of Commerce, uh, including uh, the Department of Energy, have changed uh, their uh, regime. So I think if you look at this uh, from a treasury and a state department perspective, also uh, they are um, uh, uh, watching and increasing their regulatory um, uh, uh, gambit as well. And uh, certainly Xinjiang uh, is a very important case there and something uh, that importers uh, particularly uh, need uh, to watch very carefully. 
Um, and I suspect uh, that uh, regardless of uh, the election results, we're going to have further legislation on that, probably in the lame duck session. Um, I would say uh, State Department's uh, moves on Hong Kong uh, have changed uh, uh, that uh, exporting to Hong Kong quite significantly, but particularly if you have had business with some of the uh, individuals or entities put on the, the sanctions uh, list. There are possible SDN uh, uh, designations. I would put uh, in this category, uh, although you could put it in a number of categories, the recent uh, executive orders on TikTok and, and WeChat, um, and those have been very, um, I would say nouveau, a very new type of uh, uh, control on uh, investment and technology, uh, the implications of which um, uh, might be profound. I think that we're still going through that, but you do need to watch that, uh, particularly if uh, you have uh, uh, do transactions over, over uh, WeChat uh, pay, uh, and many companies uh, in China uh, do do that. Um, and then um, uh, finally, uh, State Department has uh, and Treasury have put potential visa restrictions on uh, uh, or uh, members of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, there are other measures out there uh, as well. Um, uh, I think that we'll hear more today uh, about uh, firma and uh, investment uh, controls, but there have been cyber prosecutions. Uh, there um, have uh, been limits uh, on federal sales of many Chinese products, including uh, drones, uh, buses, rail cars, uh, telecommunications, and other, uh, uh, other equipment. So if this were all, uh, then that would be plenty, uh, but it, it is not. Um, I would note that uh, there is pending legislation that we need to be careful about. Uh, the House Republicans recently passed um, uh, or published a 160-page uh, study on China. Uh, the House, uh, the Democrats, not to be outdone, uh, passed a, a 640-page uh, rule. And I think that within the new Congress, there's going to be a meeting of the minds, uh, there, a meeting between the two parties, which is going to lead uh, probably to additional uh, legislation uh, and regulation uh, that you need uh, to be uh, concerned uh, about. So China uh, is going to continue to grow rapidly. It will be the major engine of economic growth uh, in the global economy for the next 10 years. I think that uh, China's demographics almost re require that. There's no other way. Uh, China will continue to grow very rapidly. It will continue to be a very attractive market and the regulatory structures uh, that you need to face to get your goods uh, from this side of the mighty Mississippi to the other side of the mighty Mississippi are going to um, be yet more daunting. Uh, so with that, let me turn it over uh, uh, back to Brad and uh, the others uh, to describe actually uh, how you can do that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Craig. Uh, that was very insightful. We appreciate that, you know, timely, those timely observations. I, it also underscores, um, you know, the important work that you're doing and, and the U.S. China Business Council is doing at, 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 this, at this time. You. you know, your comments uh, kind of brought to the forefront that, you know, there's a couple of reasons why training is so critical at this time. You know, one for the, for the sheer, um, uh, facilitation of information to make sure that it's applied at the, at the appropriate level of job functions and also obviously to mitigate potential risks as U.S. policy and enforcement uh, mechanisms are deployed, but also simply the construct of enabling business, you know, making sure that people at, at the professional level understand the simple issues and want to recognize the potential diversion issue or those type of risks. So uh, thank you very much, Craig, for that insight. We look forward to working with you in the, in the months ahead. So, you know, with Craig's uh, observations on some of the general policy, it's a, it's a good opportune time to take a look back at some of the practical changes that Craig referenced in, in his talk um, to, you know, what's happened over the course of the reconsiderations in policy in the last few months. So in that light, I'm uh, very pleased to introduce uh, my friend and colleague, George Gramas from Square Pet Boggs, who's gonna discuss 
the changing environment of U.S. trade compliance and export controls. So with that, let me give a quick uh, um, bio. Most of you know George. Uh, he's a partner at the Global Practice uh, at Square Patent Boggs, where he chairs the firm's international trade practice, focusing on trade compliance and national security matters across its network in 20 countries, covering more than 40 offices. George's legal practice focuses on export controls, sanctions, anti-corruption, CFIUS clearance, and other U.S. and global international trade regulatory compliance and national security matters. Over the last 30 years of practice, he was an advisor to many U.S. industry groups and the trade associations. So with that, George, um, we will uh, listen to some of your thoughts. And uh, please know that you can put any questions in the chat room, and we certainly but we'll do our best to address as many as the time allows. And if we don't have time, we'll, we'll do everything we can to make accommodations either after this session or um, you know, via email later. George? Okay, great. Thank you, Brad. And I'm delighted to follow Craig Allen's uh, excellent uh, uh, landscape description. Next slide, please. You can just, uh, next slide. Yeah, you can just uh, I imagine this graphic as a cross section of the mighty Mississippi River, and then it ties directly into Craig's presentation. I should probably change the heading of the first column from policy objectives to security dilemma. And uh, but the policy objectives that are uh, driving the the um, the changes in the regulatory environment are uh, an interest in slowing down uh, the Chinese leadership in emerging technology. Think about Made in China 2025 and what's, what you will find on that list. Uh, smart cities, smart cars, smart mining, smart manufacturing, uh, use of sensors and geo positioning, uh, and uh, the ability to manage huge amounts of data with 5G being the backbone for all of that. Uh, and um, uh, China's ability to invest in those initiatives, which is uh, unmatched uh, really by other countries, including the United States. So a desire to slow that down so that they do not run away as uh, technology leaders in these areas. Maintaining the integrity of the U.S. supply chains and uh, favoring trusted partners that are aligned with US national security and foreign policy interests. So these policy objectives are uh, the driving force behind the recent legislation, part of the National Defense Authorization Act in 2019, passed at the end of 2018, specifically the Export Control Reform Act or ECRA, uh, which you know uh, give, uh, authorizes the Commerce Department, Bureau of Industry and Security, or BIS, to review and approve exports, re-exports, and transfers to country, but which gave BIS the direction and authority to expand its, um, its, uh, its controls into new areas of emerging technology and foundational technologies. And the Foreign Investment Risk Review Modernization Act, or FIRMA, which is companion legislation to EPRA, these two are tied closely together. This authority gives CFIUS, or the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, the authority to review not just acquisitions in the United States or not just transactions that result in foreign control of a U.S. business, but even non-controlling investments in certain businesses. Uh, the result of the policy objectives and the legislation uh, are uh, the, 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 the flood that, uh, uh, that uh, Craig described. So what we see as results are the uh, extreme scrutiny of Chinese investments in the United States, but not just that, but also even for our allies in the UK or the EU, uh, because of their potential, not potential, but their actual relationships with China and their proposed investments in the United States and whether that presents a risk. And really, uh, as we've not, although the authority has been there, was we've not really seen in the same degree as it exists today, retroactive review of, of prior investments 
when there, when there is a national security concern, particularly as it relates to China, but a few other countries as well. Uh, think of, um, think of uh, uh, the uh, TikTok uh, and ByteDance example. Um, and then key companies in China are either on a list or are at risk of being on a list. So Huawei is the well-known example, but there's also threats to uh, other important companies like Tencent, uh, SMIC for uh, in, uh, integrated circuits, uh, Sinochem, and many others. Uh, these, the use of these lists has uh, become a, an important factor for Chinese industry, a great concern for them to, re, to continue their business and find, not allow themselves to be put on a list. Uh, controls of emerging and foundational technologies that control things that currently didn't, don't require a license to China. Uh, con controls on military end users and end users that's expanded in a way that can capture quite a few different Chinese companies that might not view themselves as military end users. Uh, prohibitions on uh, foreign made products and Chinese made products and uh, going to Huawei. Uh, the change in the treatment of Hong Kong. Uh, and prohibitions on use of, of uh, uh, Chinese products in U.S. government procurements, in telecommunication systems, and uh, the focus on personal data, ByteDance, uh, and Tencent again with uh, TikTok and uh, WeChat. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So for emerging and foundational technology, you've seen this list before. This is the notional uh, list of emerging technology that was published as an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking. And since this list has been published, we have seen about a half a dozen uh, different uh, final interim and final uh, rules defining control parameters for emerging technology. Uh, controlling, I don't know, maybe 20 different control parameters uh, or so. Um, and the next slide, please. And recently, we've seen the uh, advanced notice of proposed rulemaking for foundational technology, uh, which um, uh, does not provide a list, uh, but describes uh, the targets uh, in the context of those first three bullets. But to give you a sense of what might be captured by foundational technology, we're, this, is, this is George Bramus's list, not published by the Commerce Department. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're talking about items that are, again, not controlled for export to China today, EAR-99, or items controlled only for AT reasons, but some examples would be equipment, material, and software for the semiconductor manufacturing. So, you know, not just trying to capture um, the semiconductor products, but the key elements going into semiconductors. Uh, lasers and sensors for vision-guided manufacturing robots or robotics. Uh, so again, not just capturing uh, vision-guided uh, systems, but the items that are the building blocks to make vision-guided systems. Uh, Non-military underwater sonar and mapping equipment, uh, specialty materials that can be used in the aerospace applications. Uh, software that allows for intelligence gathering, uh, data mining, or creating artificial or disguised personas on the internet. Uh, all of these types of software technologies are important for, the, uh, for intelligence operations. The key takeaway uh, for you on emerging and foundational technologies as it applies to Chinese operations is that uh, uh, products made in China uh, that today are not subject to the EAR could become subject to the EAR. In other words, as uh, L different technologies and uh, inputs to production become controlled items for export to China, the, the de minimis rule and the foreign direct product rule can start to apply to the production of those items and create a situation where now those companies and operations in China need to be concerned 
about whether their products are subject to the EAR. Next few breaths. And let's talk about targeted entities or listed entities. Next few breath, please. So uh, the BIS entity list has uh, been broadly used as a way of pushing out US national security and foreign policy interests. As you know, it prohibits exports, re-exports, and in-country transfers of some or all items subject to the EAR. It depends on how it's worded how each entry is described on the list. Uh, but uh, you, you know, we've seen numerous Chinese companies, uh, notably Huawei and its different group companies. But there are still more companies to come and be added to the list. Uh, think of uh, SMIC, for example. The Commerce Department has not said that it plans to add SMIC to the entity list. But there was at least a remark by the Pentagon that they thought it should be. Um, and uh, so that could be a target as well as many others. I think one, one comment that you know, we've heard informally from the Commerce Department is that they will be looking very closely at companies that are supporting military end users and military end users in China. And that those would be uh, targets uh, for addition to the entity list. And, and of course, that was a part of what the Commerce Department is looking into with respect to uh, SMIC. And, and SMIC returned uh, on its website to make to state that it it does not engage in military end uses or military end users, uh, and that does not view itself as a military end user. Uh, so that will continue to grow. Uh, you've seen the DoD list on. Um, uh, entities that are uh, supporting uh, 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 Chinese, the Chinese military. Uh, and uh, there are numerous organizations on this, well-known organizations on this list. Um, now, that doesn't, the placement on this list by itself does not have an impact uh, directly on uh, uh, export controls. Uh, it might signal some uh, concern or red flag about military uh, end user, um, but uh, it really uh, the real only real uh, impact today is on uh, uh, procurement, uh, federal government procurement. And then we've seen a targeting of uh, Chinese uh, financial institutions. Um, uh, some have been actually pursued and others are being considered like uh, Ant Group and Tencent. And, and this makes sense because uh, the you know, US financial sector is the backbone of economic sanctions. And the reason the economic sanctions are, are, are so effective or uh, are thought to be effective is because of the, uh, the um, because of the U.S. financial institutions, so many transactions being denominated in U.S. dollars. And so uh, the development of an alternative uh, payment uh, platform, like a digital platform, is a threat to uh, uh, the continuation of sanctions. And then finally, the, uh, uh, this you know, really new regime uh, that has been placed in the Commerce Department to capture uh, apps that are involved in uh, capturing the personal data of U.S. citizens and uh, their uh, geo then their uh, and their positioning information um, uh, is uh, is you know we'll see more of this uh, at the moment. Both of these uh, orders are under both of these rules are under uh, injunction or enjoined from perform from implementation. Uh, and, it cert and it appears that it will take months to resolve this through the court systems. Next view graph. So the t uh, this view graph is, is, I won't spend time discussing this view graph, but this view graph is intended to help you understand how the entity list works with, res and in particular, how it works with respect to a Huawei entity like High Silicon. Um, I think the important take, compliance takeaway from the, um, the targeted or listed entities is um, 
the uh, you know the the not only being careful about how about dealing with compliance with listed entities, which means that the operations in China must be searching the list um, um, as part of doing business, but also they need to be concerned about not being placed on a list. And, and this means that uh, they should have strong compliance and training uh, in, in China to not only actually comply with the regulations, but when there is a concern by the US administration to be able to have auditable records that demonstrate compliance and demonstrate that they've invested in training. Uh, and, and when this is implemented to, um, or concurrently with its implementation, to develop a relationship with BIS uh, so that at that, if there is in the worst case, a situation where the company or is added to a list, uh, that is not the first time that the company goes before BIS to explain that it has strong compliance and it's striving to be uh, a player in line with the US uh, national security and foreign policy interests as expressed through the regulations. And then I think finally those organizations should uh, have a uh, break the class plan for the event that they are put on a list. In other words, be ready ahead of time uh, for, uh, to, for how they will communicate to customers and suppliers and how they will approach uh, the regulators to try and change the situation. Uh, next view, Brett. Uh, now we can talk about the, I call it the designated entity direct product rule. Uh, next view graph. And the reason I call it that is I, I want to distinguish the recent rule, foreign direct product rule, from the um, prior or in, in, and still in existence uh, foreign direct product rule, which focused on national security, uh, national security elements of the, of the input and the output. Um, so I, I think of that as a national security foreign direct product rule and the new rule from this year as the, uh, I think of it as a designated entity foreign direct product rule. Uh, this was um, uh, put out uh, uh, in the uh, earlier this year and then, and then strengthened. Uh, and uh, as uh, Secretary uh, Ross explained, uh, the purpose of this rule and the purpose of strengthening this rule is that after Huawei was placed on the entity list, Huawei found ways around uh, its designation on the entity list, essentially through outsourcing uh, its functions to other companies that were not constrained by the entity list and then could produce items that as a result of the uh, non-US contributions were not subject to the EAR and then could be supplied to Huawei. And so the, the new, the rule uh, seeks to prevent non-US organizations from exporting items to or for Huawei. And this rule is based on certain specified technology and software that you see listed at the bottom of this view graph. Uh, a lot of it deals with uh, integrated circuits. Um, and um, uh, it, um, you know, controls, it creates, it establishes that foreign made items, non-US made items that are based on this technology or software, much of which is not subject to national security controls. In fact, as you can see, a, a number of those ECCNs are only control for AT reasons. Uh, but any item that's you know, produced using this technology or software and is, and is destined for Huawei uh, directly or indirectly, even through further production, uh, is captured and cannot be, uh, uh, cannot be supplied uh, to Huawei. And perhaps even the greater problem 
is the, uh, that the use of production equipment uh, that is based on these technologies cannot be used in the production process. So here the takeaway, I think, is that Chinese companies that find themselves in a position where they really need to do business with Huawei must set up a clean, or call it a clean facility that is not uh, engaging in these technologies or using these production equipment. And um, then they need to have a process to know what the inputs are uh, for their process and what the equipment is for the process. And they have to train their procurement and engineering staff. Uh, next view graph. This next view graph just describes this uh, in more detail, which I won't cover here. One more view graph, please. And so I'd like to just touch on the military end use and end user rule. Next view graph. Uh, and uh, so um, I'm afraid I'm a little short of time, so I can't spend as much time on this rule as I, as I would like to. Uh, and maybe if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer it. But let me just raise two or three important points. One is that uh, the term military, you know, we, what, what it really means is that a, you cannot, a person, whether they're a U.S. person or a non-U.S. person, cannot export or re-export or transfer in country an item on supplement number two to part 744 uh, with knowledge that it is for military end use or military end users. So military end use means, as it as was more commonly understood before the change in the rule, refers to incorporation into an, um, a military item, whether it's on the USML or, or a 600 series. Um, but now also includes incorporation into something else that is that is not a military item, but which uh, supports or contributes to a military item. So it's a much broader concept of military end use. And then military end user lists the usual suspects, but then also adds, uh, you know, persons or entities whose actions or functions are intended to support a military end use, which brings you back to the definition of military end use and leads you to this conclusion, you know, potentially that you know, an organization that at some point or another, uh, you know, used the U.S. content uh, to in uh, the production of a non-military item that supports or contributes to a military item, um, engaged, you know, uh, in a uh, military in use and therefore may be a military user, which could capture quite a broad range of companies in China. Uh, and uh, we also recently saw many companies uh, receive an is informed type letter uh, about uh, uh, Smith uh, that um, they, they, that they cannot uh, 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 export supplement number two items to, to, to or for Smith, um, uh, even though, um, and, and this is separate and apart from the determination of a military end user, military end user. It's just, it's been, once you receive the letter, you are so informed and you have to comply with the letter. Uh, I think the takeaway on this issue for us is that, um, uh, is that the, uh, uh, the companies in China need to implement a customer checklist or customer certification process so that they can uh, uh, confirm that there's not a military end user, military end user, if they're dealing in some, something subject to the EAR. Um, and uh, US companies are doing this when they ship to China, but the Chinese company here must do the same thing. And they need to provide training to order entry and their customer relations or customer facing personnel to be uh, alive and aware to these uh, issues. Uh, next view graph will skip. So we'll go on. That's a case study. Uh, then on Hong Kong, uh, next view graph, please. Uh, I'll just mention that uh, you know DDTC's position is uh, they're not approving licenses or agreements for Hong Kong, but they're also not going to. They're not currently planning to suspend or terminate the existing licenses or agreements. And for BIS. Uh, they're, um, they've discontinued the use of numerous um, uh, uh, license exceptions for Hong Kong, uh, but one could still apply for a license. It's just that the licensing policy will treat it as if it's uh, China. 
uh, next few graphs. So finally, let me wrap up with uh, these just thoughts about uh, compliance and training, considering that's the topic today, and uh, that it is important for you to have a process for briefing management and making them aware of these uh, requirements, and, but specifically including the leadership in, in China so that they can appreciate the actual risks to the business in China uh, if they don't take US export controls uh, seriously. And also there's a need for employee level training to not only understand the policies and the regulations, but the compliance program and what their responsibilities are. And this training needs to be functionally oriented um, a little bit as I described as I was hitting the takeaways. Uh, and it needs to be uh, consistent and repeatable, which is a reason that I think the, uh, the kind of training that we're describing today with content enablers is important. So a number of companies will think this is important. If you're a large organization, they can't possibly provide live training to all your employees. But I would suggest actually even for smaller organizations, this type of training ensures that the training is consistent and repeatable and therefore you can confirm and, and, and you have an auditable record to show that actually what, was, what they were trained on and, and what they should understand. Next few graphs. So uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Brad uh, for the remaining few minutes. And I think we'll have time for questions at the end. Thank you, George. Uh, that was a you know, very thorough and uh, presentation and really underscores the dynamic nature of the environment we're dealing with. And your conclusion regarding training was uh, well said. And I think it brings two conclusions to light. You know, one is the fact that no matter how good your training is, it's at risk of potentially being uh, dated in the minute it's developed unless there's some type of protocol to ensure development of ongoing maintenance of content. So I'd like uh, to take a second to make sure that people understand that one of the principal benefits of our platform and what we're doing with JAR is the platform allows the functional training to be presented at, at a professional functional level, compliance practitioner or executive leadership and our content management system through our uh, subject matter partners are constantly updating the content. So as these regulatory changes and policy evolutions occur, uh, that content is uh, updated. Second thing that's, that you brought up, I think is critical, is discussing the idea of documenting and creating an audit trail for your, for your training, both for your internal management and possible regulatory analysis later. And it's one of the principal benefits of our relationship with SHAR is the ability to provide the certifications of completed, completion for the different functions. So George, as always, thank you for your keen insight. We appreciate that. And with that, um, I would like to, um, uh, introduce uh, Dean Mark Rosell uh, from the Shara School, uh, who is going to discuss um, the Shara School's commitment to supporting the compliance training certification as we look to help clients mitigate risk and enable their trade. So a quick bio, uh, Mark is the founding dean of the Shara School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. He holds the Ruth D. and John T. Hazel Chair of Public Policy. Mark is the author of nine books and the editor of 20 additional books on various topics in US government politics. He's testified before Congress on executive privilege issues and has lectured extensively in the US and abroad. He frequently writes opinion columns for major media outlets such as The Hill, New York Daily News, and Politico. He's often asked to comment about his area of expertise for television and publications such as The Washington Post and Time Magazine. He currently serves as the judge for the Gerald R. Ford Award Committee for Outstanding Reporting and Presidency of the Gerald R. Ford Foundation. So, um, you know, Mark, we've worked together now for last year or so, introducing the new uh, SHAR certification program for our U.S. content. And we're very excited to be partnering with you as we roll out the uh, content for uh, companies in the uh, in, uh, in China. And so I'd like to just uh, hear some of your thoughts um, that you can share with our delegates today about uh, um, Char and, and how we will look forward to working together in the future. 
Great, thank you, Brad. Delighted to be here, and I'll be brief in case people have questions as we're getting close to the end here. Um, but this is really very compatible with the Shar School's commitment to professional education in various fields of public policy and public administration. Uh, one of our leading programs, as you know, Brad, is our master's degree in international commerce and policy. And our relationship really grew out of the expertise of a good many of our colleagues in the Shar School uh, in that particular field. Uh, we offer both degree programs and also certificate programs for those who need professional training and education. Um, for the certificate programs, there's a lot of people who want that additional professional training and education, but not a full master's degree. Uh, what's interesting is that many of our certificate students end up going on anyway, since they've gone almost halfway toward the master's degree in doing the uh, certificate study program. Uh, but these are a part of what we're doing in our commitment to provide professional training and education more broadly uh, in the Washington community. Uh, very apropos today's conversation, we have long-standing cooperative arrangements with Chinese institutions. Uh, we have partnered with several Chinese universities, for example, for uh, what are called 311 programs, which bring students from China for a year, uh, often two years, um, to complete both their bachelor's degree and their final year of study and add an additional year for a master's degree program. Uh, so we bring a number of students from China over for these types of cooperative arrangements. We have scholarly exchanges, study abroad programs. I've been a regular lecturer every year uh, in the country, as have several of my colleagues who have lectured and also taught courses there. Uh, we also host regularly visiting scholars every year from China in the Shar School. And of course, a number of our doctoral students uh, are from China as well. I think even with some of the challenges, by the way, in the U.S.-China relationship, we've not seen a real drop-off in interest in any of these initiatives. So we're at least doing our part to keep things moving forward and trying to enhance cooperative relationships and better understanding uh, between the countries. One of our most interesting activities, by the way, within the Shar School is our training programs for international visitor groups, which in use, recent years actually have been mostly Chinese um, business people, academics, and municipal level officials. Many of them actually are coming to the Shar School to learn about the regulatory environment in the United States and how to do business in the U.S. and how to uh, work with uh, different levels of government. Uh, there's a lot of interest in um, uh, U.S. federalism and the relationship among the different levels of government and how we establish and work through those relationships. And we typically have about 30 to 40 groups every year, several hundred participants coming uh, to the Shore School. Pre-pandemic, of course, it's all um, uh, stopped uh, at least, temporarily, at least. We're doing some online programs, but not as much as we were doing before. So we really look forward to this new cooperative relationship with content enablers and Squire Patent Boggs as well today to advance uh, professional understanding of trade compliance issues, which, as we've heard this morning, can be quite complex. So I just want to thank everybody for attending this morning, and uh, thank you, Brad, for uh, reaching out for developing this cooperative relationship um, between content enablers and the Shar School. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, that was a uh... You know, a, a great way to wrap up today's session. So, uh, you know, let me just say for all of our uh, our friends and the uh, delegates today that we're, we're particularly excited, proud to be working with Shar because you know not only are we actively working on our program together, the reason we're so pleased to work with them is because of their unique um, standing in the trade class community and then what you're doing, Mark, and for the certification program, in addition to what you're doing with us, I just think it's so impressive and we really encourage people to take a look at what the additional opportunities are through the various SHARP programs. So uh, we hope you enjoyed today's session. We tried to give a general overview of not only the the practical offerings that we're working on together, but kind of some of the policy and strategic uh, reasons for why we're conducting it. So uh, we look forward to working with all of you and we, we encourage you to take a look at the website and see what programs are available. Um, and we'll follow up with any questions uh, afterwards. We do have, I'm sorry, um, let me just take a look quick um, at the questions, see if there's any that we should, if we have time for. Um, all right, well, you know, 
I'm sure I'm able to do that. So again, thank you to uh, Craig Allen from the U.S. China Business Council and to George Gramis from Square Pen Bugs. And of course, uh, Dean Roselle from George Mason University, the Shara School. Thank you all. We look forward to um, helping you in your China training. Take care. Thank you for attending today's webinar. A recording of this session will be available in the coming days, and we will be in touch uh, to let you know how to access that recording. For more information about Content Enablers Online train, uh, Trade Compliance Training for Companies Doing Business in China, go to www.china.tradecompliance.courses.